You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Dr. Benjamin Ritter, founder of Live For Yourself Consulting. Ben, how are you today? I'm doing absolutely wonderful. A little cold out here in Austin, Texas with the snow on the ground, which is a little weird, but luckily um, I'm here having a great warm heart felt, right? Warming conversation with you. I hope so. Well, you know, and I don't think of, I don't think anyone does associate Austin with it being cold. So it has to be uh, a little out of the ordinary for you guys, right? Yeah, just a little bit. It's probably just cold because of the, I think the general uh, feelings of the labor market right now, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit, uh, the talent wars and such that are ongoing. I suspect that'll come up. It's been an interesting time. Um, in, in the market for sure. How is it in Austin though? I, you know, I, I, I'm in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we see, we're seeing it here. I I'm in touch with a lot of staffing peers around the country. And I know that what we're seeing in, um, in national headlines are starting, it's starting to trickle down, you know, at the local level, smaller companies too, but how's the, um, market in Austin? Cause it's usually really hot where you guys are. Uh, for yeah, I think there are going to be anyway. markets. Yeah, there, there are markets that are impacted but there's always people hiring. I think when we discuss talent opportunity, that if you are targeted and specific, you're going to find it. If you're just kind of throwing everything at the wall and see what sticks, then you're probably going to miss something. So the people that are really, you know, this in times like this, where people are afraid, the people that stay motivated, stay positive, and especially stay targeted and get personal, so reach out to people specifically, they're going to create the opportunities for themselves. I couldn't agree more. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, Ben, before we go too far, uh, tell me tell me about your, your consulting business, Live For Your Life Consulting. What, what is it that you do and what do you offer? I like how you said live for your, live for your life because that for also yourself. resonates to me. Live for yourself. Uh, that, that, that resonates fully because yeah, it's very much similar to live for yourself is you are living for your life. You know, we are we are the most important people in our own life. You know, the most important leader in your life is yourself. You make your own decisions ultimately. You choose who to follow. You choose what to believe. And too often, we give that power away to our external environment or even our internal environment, our limiting beliefs, which tends to be the thing that most holds us back in our life. Oh, I can't apply for that job. I don't have those qualifications or I can't say that to my leader or I can't do whatever. That's too uncomfortable. So live for yourself. Consulting is a, a way to help empower and create accountability in the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow. So we mainly work with senior leaders. So C-suite VPs, directors, and help them be the leader of their own career. So really craft a career that is aligned with their values. And to do that though, we have to create career clarity. We have to define their professional brand. So also make sure that aligns you know, with their LinkedIn and their resume and their tools, but as well as how they present, present themselves, the stories that they tell. And then build a community and network that supports that vision, those goals and that brand, so that then they can take steps forward, right? To get the next job and the next job and the next job and create opportunities for themselves to ultimately be fulfilled in their career. And which what I see too often, right, prevents the fact that someone goes into work each and every single day, dreading work, going into work, not to work, and then taking that negativity and that resentment and using it to one, burn bridges in their career, but also, you know, take away energy and, and experiences from their personal life. So the first uh, clip that I, I heard you speak in was what I consider to be somewhat of an epiphany moment. It sounds like you had, I don't know if you would use that phrase, but you described walking into work and realizing it was a place you didn't want to be, shouldn't be. And um, it sounds like you, you made a, a serious life and career change at that moment. T talk about that for a little bit. So at this point in time, just for a little context, I was working in healthcare I was promoted into an executive level role or just on the executive level, on the executive team and was dreading work. I would basically, again, went into work, not to work, would leave to go to the gym for two and a half hours during the day for lunch, would skip out early, get in late, wouldn't have conversations with people because I didn't see the point in, 
investing in those relationships, but was still thought of as a high achiever because I got my work done. I got what I needed done, which is what you see in a lot of high potentials that are disengaged. They do what needs to get done. They do it really well. They don't really do anything else. And they hide the fact that they're not doing anything else because they do everything else so much faster. Uh, but I got to this point in my life through a lot of different disappointments to my career. First thing I ever wanted to do for a living got crushed. I had four job offers during a recession that all got basically like someone offered me a job. I signed on the dotted line and the job got torn up the next day because of funding. And so I kind of fell into healthcare and luckily I networked into it, but I was pretty, very reactive to that opportunity. And in another area of my life, personal development, I was highly focused, highly engaged. I grew into an individual that had confidence, that was motivated, that was comfortable with the things that were uncomfortable. But for some reason, I felt that my professional life was a different world that didn't operate by the same standards and beliefs and factors that could influence it. And so I gave up all my power. And so I felt like a victim. I played the victim when it came to being happy at work, finding a fulfilling career. Didn't realize that I could actually craft something for myself and just lived with it until I was walking into work that day. And I don't know why, uh, but I think, I think, I think every single day that this happened, and I was walking into work, making eye contact with people that were passing me by. And for some reason, I noticed that it seemed like everyone was dreading what they were going to do. They all looked like they were walking zombies. They all looked like they wished they could be doing anything else. And as I looked at them and I saw that in their eyes, I realized I was really seeing myself. And for the first time ever, it occurred to me that I didn't have to feel this way. That it was my fault that I was allowing this to occur. That's and so a, that little that's, eureka moment, yeah. That's yeah. an important, that's a powerful thing, right? That it was your fault. It was not the fault of your employer. It was not the fault of, of you know, the situation that you were in, but it was something you had complete control over. And I've said somewhat, you know, in, in, in a lighter sense over the years, being in, in staffing is that we have to understand the priorities and motivations and drive of the individuals we work with, because the only thing they have to do in a day is get up and go to bed. Everything else they choose in between is, is a matter of priority and what's important to them. Yet, I think most of us don't go through the day realizing that. It's almost autopilot. Um, this clearly wasn't something that just uh, occurred to you in the moment. I mean, it, was, it had to be building, right? Or did it really just kind of come, come, uh, you know, all, all together at once. And you, and you had this, this realization that you were in the wrong place. I knew I was in the wrong place, but I didn't realize what I could do about it. I didn't realize that there was more than just applying to a job on a job board. I didn't realize that I could have gotten more from my time there if I decided to invest in career capital, instead of trying to just hide from the feelings. You know, and, and basically let my beliefs that this wasn't right for me control my actions. How common do you do you believe that to be? I I have my own thought, but but how how prevalent is that in, among yeah the American workforce of 165 million or so? I think a lot more than we want to admit, because we aren't we don't have the belief. And I, I think just and when I say we, I mean the the universal employee doesn't have the belief that they are responsible for their levels of job satisfaction at work. And so they're waiting for their organization to make them happy. They're waiting for their leader to make them happy. And so they go into work and when something doesn't go right, they start telling themselves the story that they're not happy. And it is very hard for someone to stop telling themselves that story when they have one negative experience. And so people tend to have a negative experience at work. And very often they focus on that negative experience and in, instead of the positive experiences or, or successes or wins that they have and positive feedback and recognition are so rare when it comes to an organization that is very unlikely for that person to be knocked out of their negative beliefs about their job. 
So I think way too more, way it's it's much more prevalent than we actually know exists. You think that's? Um, I agree with you 100. percent By the way, I think it's very common. Um, it's a bit of a scary thing though to take responsibility for your own uh, career satisfaction, right? Isn't it easier to blame uh, your employer? It depends on what you would prefer to feel each and every single day. I think we are prone to blame our employer because we have, we're misled in our belief systems. And it is really hard for some people, I bet, especially listening to this show right now, to accept the fact that if you're unhappy at work, that you're the one that made yourself unhappy. Like, unless you're in a severely toxic environment where, I mean, you're getting called names every day, you are getting yelled at, uh, you there is racism or bias, which is there, but I don't, I don't think is the majority of where the work environment. It is really hard for individuals to accept the fact that they could be happy somewhere that they're not. I work with a lot of clients that think the only option is to leave their employer or to start their own business. And the people that want to become entrepreneurs have such a negative belief system of what it means to work for somebody else because of an experience they've had with a leader at one point in time in an organization, or maybe they were burnt out at one, at one point that it is almost impossible for them to envision themselves working for someone, even in the most perfect environment, which is a little mind boggling. Say, okay, so you could have everything you ever dreamed for, but it would be working for someone else. What would be the downfall of that? And the stories that they've told themselves now because of their negative beliefs, make it, make them, it make it almost impossible for them to accept that vision of their future. I, I, I want to ask you about entrepreneurism, but you, you mentioned a word that has, has come on uh, into popularity, at least as far as I am aware, over the last couple of years in that you know, concept of a toxic environment. I think it's overused. I, I think you know, what the examples that you gave when you used it are certainly toxic by any definition, right? They're, they're unacceptable, to say the least. But when I see it used and in, in described, you know, LinkedIn is a great place for this, where um, you, you see that you have uh, you know, upset employees using using the word. And and I think, and I as I admitted to you already before we started recording, I'm I'm a bit old school with some of my thoughts, which I have to balance. I, I acknowledge that, but often my thought is that's not toxic. <laughs> that's just a work you know, environment, right? Um, but once that label is put on it, it it's like everything about it is, you know, has a negative connotation. Do you think it's overused? It's hard to say. I do feel, though, that people are a little bit more needy when it comes to the work environment than probably before. Or they're quick to judge. And they're not quick to forgive. Judgment is one of the reasons why people are unhappy at work. I judge my coworker for saying this thing. I judge my employer for saying this thing, my leader for saying this thing. If we instead were to give people the benefit of the doubt and then figure it out, well, how could I leverage my current environment to serve my career? Then we may not be using that toxic word so much. Right. But it almost is looking like people are searching for a reason to disengage, searching for a reason not to work hard, searching for a reason to go somewhere else. I will admit, though, I, I do work with a lot of clients that have terrible boundaries when it comes to their work environment and care deeply about their employer and their leader and their team and worry too much about what people think about them. So it's you have examples on both sides. I know we were talking about the toxic a toxic environment. So I guess not to veer too far off track, I'd say if you believe you're in a toxic environment, can you challenge yourself on those beliefs? Can you ask other people that aren't your friends about your experiences to see maybe if there's a different perception? Or is your reaction to this supposed toxic environment serving your career path and serving your potential opportunities in your current job and serving your ability to build relationships? Or is it hindering it? Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, you don't want the echo chamber, right? If you're if let's you're, do the echo chamber. <laughs> no, um, but it it's uh, you know it's why, how did this evolve? Do you think? Uh, so, you know, go, going back to 
this idea of of dissatisfaction, unhappiness at work. Um, you think it's always been been there, or is this something that's that's evolved um, as you know society continues to change rapidly? We know that um, it's changing as we speak, right? There's a lot of about the workforce is changing right now. Um, in my opinion, a lot of it's for the good, the really good. Um, but I think there's this, um, I, I agree with you. One of the things that I hear a lot is, you know, young people being, being told to, you know, go get a job, right? Like that's their goal, you know, with their, their degree, their education, their, you know, it, it, which I think is awful and, and like just completely demoralizing. But, um, how do you, how do you think this has evolved where people are accepting of, of these, of being unhappy, whether it's their, you know, the, the organization is bad, whether the environment's bad, it doesn't really matter, but spending your, your work life unhappy seems to be something no one should accept. Why, how do you think we got here? I think we're getting better, a lot better. I think we're actually at a point where people are asking for more than asking for less. So the unhappiness is leading to actions and changes in the work environment, which I'm really happy about since I have a job, which is wonderful because employers aren't really sure how to react to the desires and to needs of employees, where now an employee is asking for more from their employer in terms of, you know, I want you to make me happy all the time instead of make me happy just at work. And I want you to be a factor to why I'm happy all the time, not just when I'm at work. And how that involved, evolved, I think there's a lot of different factors. I probably couldn't isolate just one other than the fact that you know, our needs as individuals has, have evolved, but all, I think the easiest thing I could say is we, uh, as, as human beings have certain needs that our employer can help fulfill. And we are realizing that our employer has the capability of fulfilling them. And so then we hold them responsible to it when we should be holding ourselves responsible but, and that's hopefully what I'm here to do. And it's a, it's a very broad answer, but I, I think it's important to think about that we've lost the ability to fulfill ourselves from our personal life for a variety of reasons. And so we're looking for our employer to help us fulfill ourselves in those ways. Do you think that that goes beyond financial health? Right. Because you know, the core of the employee employer relationship, in my opinion, is you know, there, there's there's a job that needs to be done. This is a very crude way to say it. Right. There's a job that, that needs to be done. Uh, there's a, a willingness to pay you know, for the work that needs to be accomplished. And then, you know, the on the other side, someone um, is exchanging their time um, and expertise and skill for uh, that compensation. Right. Like that is the basis for the employee, you know, employee employer relationship, you know, in a very crude way again. Um, but the expectation seems so much beyond that. Do you, do you, do you, first of all, do you agree that that is the basis for, for the relationship or at least it should be? When we get to the heart of it, I guess what, you know, we earn money from our employer. And so the basis of that relationship is financial, but an employer, if that was all, that that relationship was would have to then compete solely on financial uh, on a financial scorecard and that's not how employers compete right? they compete by what are the values of the organization what are the benefits from the organization what is what is the culture and the other relationships within the organization what is the leadership style what is the location what are the you know is it remote or is it in person what are the skills that they're asking from you so there's it's not just a financial competition. And so I would, I mean, you can even say, I'm really liking where this conversation is going, that the needs of the employee are actually creating a competitive opportunity for employers. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and I don't mean to imply in any way that it's the entirety of the relationship, just that it's the basis, right? That a job needs to be done. Therefore, an employer has to you know, find someone with the right skill to do that job. Someone with that skill needs to agree to do that job, 
right? And, and, and generally speaking, it's going to be an exchange of value, right? In terms of I'm going to trade my time and skill for compensation. I do think that's the basis, but I, I don't think that is the, like I said, even close to being the entirety from it. You know, you could just say you know, something as simple as, well, if you have to work with another individual, do you get along with them, right? <laughs> do you do you enjoy interacting with them? Is there a mutual respect? Um, you can you can go many many levels beyond that, and and you should. Um, but it seems to me that somewhere along the way, and and there's I, I've read a lot about the history of this, so uh, uh, you know, how unions were formed, for example, right, which makes employment a team sport in, in many respects, which I find you know, just you know, fascinating and, and generally terrible uh, for all involved. Um, but we, we've we evolved here and no one really questions why at this point, right? It's almost going through the motions back to my comment about uh, advice. I would not advice. It was, it was almost, I was directed to go to school, get a degree, get a job. And I hear that even today. And I think, what? That's no, they, no, <laughs> that's, that's awful. It's all outdated. It's all outdated. And we're playing catch up. I mean, just like our educational system. Um, there are also some really great books. If listeners are interested, I'd recommend the book, Do Nothing. I believe that was it. That goes over kind of the work history uh, of how work has evolved. I'm sure there are some other ones as well. And Pete, do you have any resources around the evolution of work from the, you know, why we did work for 40 hours and where, Not where off are the top standards of my head? I, you know, no, no, I, I, and it's to your, I'm glad you mentioned the book. I'm going to have to pick it up because I haven't read books on it as much as I've, you know, just researched it in terms of wanting to understand. And my research has largely been through, through, you know, Google searches. Uh, I, I should be maybe embarrassed to say, but, um, you know, specifically when uh, the union negotiation was taking place recently, um, you know, regarding the rail workers and it, it, it just, it's, I'm, I, I'm a Floridian. I've lived in Florida my whole life. Unions are not prevalent here. It's not something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but in the scope of, of, of your know, universal career advice and guidance and what's what people need, I did spend some time researching the history of unions recently, and it's fascinating to see you know, why why they existed originally. Um, as you said, you know, it seems like a dated concept in many respects, and I know they provide value in certain areas. But um, I, I just think today we we you know, we all are living this existence that we didn't choose, and and you know, in many respects, it's very it is very dated. Employees have more power. And with that power, the work environment has to adjust. Because as, as you were saying, employers need employees, at least for right now. And for, for, cer for certain jobs, right? That changes based on the growth of technology. And because of that power, and you see employees using it, certain changes have to happen within an organization where it's not just here, do this job, and I expect that person to do that job. I have to do it in a way that also coaches or also provides us positive feedback and recognition, or I'm going to lose that person to another organization. And we could wish for the days where it's like, hey, just be happy you have a job, which employers have that power when the, you know, when, when unemployment is really high, but they don't really have that power when unemployment is low. And I think it's, it's just the factors of, you know, the current economy and what's happening. And I, I would actually love for every employee, every individual to break out of that and instead being able, be able to really find what they need where they're at and ensure they have a plan to continue growing where they're at, or if not where they're at, where they, where they could go next, instead of being a little bit more uh, handcuffed, right, to the current economic conditions. These are interesting times in the job market. Um, needless to say, it's it's a moving target right now, and and even knowing um, what data to to count, rely on is is its own challenge. Um, it, it, but we know that there's still, you know, in the in the in the scope of of American history, it's still a very good time to be a job seeker at this point in time where we have close to you know 10 million job openings in, in the US. Um 
and you know, the the growth of the freelance market uh, continues, and and uh, you know, just remote work has off is provides so many opportunities now. I mean, I I think in many respects it's both a a a, a a scary time uh, to be a job seeker when you see what's going on in the news, but also a, a really exciting time because you know opportunity has never been more abundant. I, I do believe that. But why why do you think most people settle? You know, here you know, the, the you know the people that you work with that you help. Uh, you mentioned that most of them are, are senior um, in their career, so these are people who you know um, certainly have options, certainly have uh, uh, you know experience. Why are they settling as a rule, or is that not a simple answer? It's not a simple answer, but just in general, people that are settling have never asked themselves the questions of what they want, so they don't have clarity around it, and they're operating from a place of fear, a place of scarcity. They don't fully believe that they could get whatever they wanted if they spent the time to figure out what they wanted. So it tends just to come from a aspect of career clarity and then confidence and then creating the intention, right? The control around their life to go build a community and to, to go after what it is they care about. The clarity piece is huge. And especially when you deal with high achievers it's because their goals didn't have much to do with passion and purpose and clarity of values and such. It was more so title and money. Now, if we're looking at the general population, usually it's because they applied for their first job. That first job dictated their career path. They took what came to them, right? either a referral from a friend or a promotion, or maybe they came across a job one day because of a recruiter. And then they end up maybe five jobs down the line, six jobs down the line, realizing they didn't actually put much thought into their career. And so now they're like, oh, I developed into this person and I learned all these things, but I don't actually feel like I chose any of it because they really didn't. Is there a way to break that cycle? Is it realistic to break that cycle? Well, even if you're in a place that you don't like, you've had experiences over that time that have built certain interests and passions and values, right? even just from how you grew and the people around you. And you've become good at certain things and learned that you don't like certain things. And so you can sit down and create clarity around what you're interested in. And most of the time, it's actually not that different from what people are doing. It's just different enough and outside what they're currently doing and something that they're choosing that brings them that much sat that much satisfaction. So it is possible to break the cycle, but you have to have that epiphany, right? The epiphany I had, I think the epiphany that you shared as well, that I'd love for you, if your audience hasn't heard that yet, to share it too, to wake you up, to help you realize that you're uncomfortable enough and confident enough that you can create something new for yourself. Well, you know, in my own, I, it, you know, when I look back now to the moment that I had 17 and a half years ago, it was, it came to me. I, I didn't seek it out. And, you know, the, in the, in the, just a quick story is I was, I was happy. I was, uh, I, I was, you know, I, my boss you know, was in another uh, part of the state. I worked at home. I, I made, you know, my income was great. Um, life was good um, in the role that I was in. But then my, um, my regional VP, I've told the story so much. I wonder, I don't even know if he has any idea that I've told <laughs> told this story so many times. My regional vice president, uh, the large technology company I was working for was reorg out of his job. No fault of his own. This guy did everything right. And it scared the hell out of me because I I looked at this and said, this is what I'm aspiring to, to do. This is the role that I want. And this guy was making probably three times my income. And I that was the track that I was on. And I realized that my the fate of my family. My wife was pregnant with our third child at the time was, was not my own. So to me, the, the fear was not taking control of my own destiny. So when I decided to quit my job to start a business, which I would not advise for most people, and let me be explicitly clear about that, you know, going, if I knew at that time 
that if they offered me a 20 year contract, I've said this so many times over the years uh, that um, I would have signed it and, and, and been ecstatic. Uh, it, it, but that those things don't exist. We know that. So I was not unhappy or dissatisfied in any way. I just realized, wow, this my future is very uncertain if I don't take control of my own destiny. And so that's why I did it. And this is also a very relevant point. I had the same idea in mind for 10 years that I talked about going to start um, a staffing business. So what I've seen over the years, um, and I don't want to get too off, off track, Ben, is that when it, when people would say, wow, I want to go start my own business, I'd say, great, what's your idea? Well, I don't have an idea. I just want to go start my own business. Okay, stop. <laughs> don't, no, no. Because there are pros and cons. And uh, for years, I missed working for another organization. It, you know, there's a big trade-off that comes and we we could talk for days about that. We won't do it, but um, it's not all roses. And there's a lot of benefit to having someone else uh, worry about all the details and how the bills are paid. And, 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 you know, so I'm not anti-employer by any stretch. It just was a situation that I was in, but um, I think, you know, I, I do wonder as life goes on, my responsibilities grew. I mean, I did this when I had, you know, my third child on the way and, and, you know, had expenses just and responsibilities. It is scary to make a move. I mean, it is hard. It sounds great in theory, but, but, you know, what, what, what do you tell people that say, Ben, I'm, I'm unhappy, but I'm handcuffed. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's real at some level, isn't it? Handcuffs are as real as you want them to be. We are very resilient people. And most of the time, if we were actually to sit back and think about, well, what's the worst that could happen? We'd be fine. It may take some time. It might be stressful. It might be frustrating, but you'd make it work. And it's a really good activity to take people through. What's the worst that could happen? Especially with people that aren't happy at work. So let's say, let's take, for example, someone that is overworked, that is burnt out, that thinks that their employer is working them to the bone, which by the way, if you have this person sit down and time out their day, most of the time they're not working 40 hours a week. Not many of us are. We just think that we are. And I think most of us are probably working about 20 hours of productive time per week. You're being generous. 40 hour. <laughs> yeah, the 40 hour work week model is, is ridiculous. Uh, but uh, this person could sit back and let's say they, they were just overwhelmed and you tell them to just stop doing the thing that they think is so important. And I asked them, how long would it take you to get fired? It's usually a pretty long time. And I say, well, how long, what if you just decreased your output by 50%? How long would it take you to get fired? Probably, probably wouldn't happen. And so a lot of the times our handcuffs are things that we just ima imagine based on our fear. And unless we sit back and actually try to define our fear, what we're afraid of and play it out, it's going to, it's going to still be a handcuff. Well, it goes, I think without saying, I'll say it anyway, that if you're dissatisfied in the, in, in your work day, it's going to carry over through other aspects of your life. Is, is that something that most of your clients realize that or is that what makes brings them to you in the first place is when they, they, they realize they're because you can't. Yeah. Being drained, being distracted. Those tend to be the two things, you know, not being able to be present and not having energy to do the things that you care about. So people that tend to be unhappy at work also tend to not be able to keep up with healthy habits. They tend to have less patience with their kids and with their partners and their relationships they tend to have a hard time being social. So it, it actually is a, is a major drain on you mentally and physically. And that's the reason why they come to me because they can't, they can't take it anymore. They can't imagine another year like that, another five years like that. So when I um, was looking at your, your ebook, I, I, what jumped out at me was the word exploration. It was something that you highlighted. And I mentioned earlier, I have, I have four children. My, um, my second oldest is a junior in college and he's changed majors a couple of times. Uh, yeah, it, common story. And I am encouraging him as best I can to, um, to take as much time as he needs, not, you know, provided his activity is high in this effort of trying different things. 
exploring, um, so to speak. And so when I saw that you recommended that, I felt better about my advice because I'm not the expert that you are. I'm making it up as I go as a parent <laughs> every day. Uh, but it's something that I do believe in and I think that is generally lacking. So I'm you know, trying to, you know, having the perspective that I do on careers and, and seeing people change jobs, you know, tens of thousands of them over the years. Uh, I, I think if we take that time early, it's easy. As life goes on, it's probably harder to explore. I mean, can a 50 year old, you know, who, who has, you know, a, a mortgage and, and, and lots of bills to pay. Do you, I mean, you want them to explore is there a process that you take them through that enables them to to do that versus a, the twenty year old that you know doesn't have any any bills to pay you know even close to you know what someone later in life has? I mean, I, I just I guess my my question is, it's would you agree that it's increasingly difficult as as life goes on? But do you have a solution for that um, anyway? I think it's a great idea that for a young individual to jump jobs as often as as quick as possible. And if they're not sure what, what they want to do because the best way to learn is to have an experience. So love that advice because as you said, as you get older, it gets a little bit harder, not impossible, but harder. But as I mentioned, you know, usually when we're older, we don't want to shift things dramatically. You know, the, the CEO of the ball bearing company doesn't want to quit and join the circus. Yeah, I think I had one client once that humored the idea of becoming a beekeeper. You know, he was a medical sales executive. Didn't end up doing it. But for me, I'm like, go, go get some bees. Put them in your backyard. Go to the local farm. Go hang out. Go volunteer once a week. So we can explore our interests. And by the way, let's say he ended up wanting to become a beekeeper, but he wanted to keep his same levels of financial wealth. He could do it as a hobby, or he could go work for a, a honey company as their you know, executive sales individual, or go work for one of the largest bee selling companies in the US. He could leverage his strengths and his skills and his experiences to, to work in the industry and as close to it as possible but without having to you know, feel like he gave up everything that he created. So I think we are limited by our beliefs of what is possible. If you can think about it, you can make money doing it and you can leverage the skills that you've developed over the years doing it as well. If you want to be a beekeeper, what a shame, right? To to not explore that. And and because that was that was, you know, I think of my own situation, or again, the advice I, I give to my children is what what a wonderful thing it would be if you could combine your true interest, you know, what I think of is what, you know, when I you know, talk to my kids, I say, what, what do you, what do you go to bed thinking about? What do you wake up thinking about? What's on your mind when you have nothing else, you know, to, to burden you gravitate towards that. Right. Uh, and, and as an adult, it's even more important. I think like if you wake up I mean, if that's your hobby and that's what you're spending time on, what a shame to not combine that with, with how you spend your waking day and, 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 and generate income because, I assume you're going to put a lot more into it than the job you don't like going to every day. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a gift. Honestly, it's, if you know what you want, that is such a gift. Go, go, go explore it. Like if someone walked up to you with something, you know, something wrapped in a bow over the holiday season, would you leave it there and not open it? It'd be rude. Also, you probably would be very interested in what's in that box. <laughs> and so if you know, what it is that you're passionate about and you're per, and you're what you feel you're, you're called to. It's such a disservice not to explore it. I'm not selling, go, I'm not saying go quit your job, you know, and, and give up everything that you've ever, you know, that you've developed over the years. What I'm saying, just go get a taste of it. You calling it a gift is, is perfect in, in my opinion. And so I don't, I don't think people stop maybe, right? Are we just on this, this, this treadmill where, where you're, you're just going, you go from, you know, from living at home to, to being out on your own and paying bills. And what we're talking about, I think is, is stopping and really considering why you're doing what you're doing and what, whether your interests match your, your, your income. And I, I don't keep I mean to keep going back to income, but 
it is the, the, the core, right, of, of that relationship at some level where you, you, and I think if you could, and I've known only a handful of people who I could say this about, where if you could say, well, I take income out of the equation, am I still doing it? Am I still showing up? And if you can answer yes to that, that's, that's utopia, is it not? I mean, but, but how many people can say that? Yeah, I have a tough one with that because if I didn't have to work, I probably would operate very differently. I would, I'd say if you took income out, if you took income away from the, from what you currently do, would you at times do it or learn about it or study it or want to talk about it or explore it? Because I think people get held up on the, well, would I come into work every day if I wasn't being paid? No, probably wouldn't. But would you craft a life around your interests? Would you at times read a book about it? Would you want to talk about it at dinner parties? Would you, you know, want to, like for me, would I want to coach occasionally? Yeah, I would. I, I'm an anomaly, so I'm not the one to answer this because I've, I discovered something four years ago that I do think about every night when I go to bed and, th and every morning, and I'm currently not making any money doing it, even though it's consuming a lot of my time and thought. Um, and I don't know that I will, but I know that it's, it, 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 you know, I, I, even I, even though I can't articulate to someone else, uh, necessarily, I, I, I feel excitement and enthusiasm for it. And like you said, I, I, I do consider it a gift to discover something that, um, I get to do every day. Right. And I don't have to do, I I'm choosing to do every day. And that to me is the best case scenario. So, um, let, let me ask you this, where do people go? Where do people start? I could I could pick your brain all day on this stuff, Ben, and, and I know you don't have all day to give me because, I, uh, but I need help, and I think if if I need help, and most people do, or it, I I do, I because I don't think they're thinking beyond the day to day. Where do they start? I'm quiet because I'm grabbing a book. So I have a couple favorite ones. You know, first off, reach out to me on LinkedIn, connect with me, send me a message. I can guide you to some resources that I have. I have some podcasts. I have some videos. I have the free ebook at my website. If you go to liveforyourselfconsulting.com, I can help you out. I have worksheets about the career sweet spot. I have workshops I've recorded. There's so many materials out there. I'd also recommend some of my favorites because I think this industry is incredible. So check out So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport, one of my favorite books about creating career capital and putting in the work. You know, you, you don't find your passion, you create it. So go pick something, get great at it, and you'll become passionate about it. Another one that I don't think as many people know about is 80,000 Hours by Benjamin Todd and the 80,000 Hours team. It's an incredible book about finding a career that does good. But look, if you're in, one of the greatest mistakes, and it blows my mind, of the people that, I, that come to me for coaching is that they've done nothing. They didn't go on Google and look up career fulfillment. They don't go on podcasts and listen to stuff like this. Another one, uh, Let's Eat Grandma is a great podcast. I mean, they're the, oh, sorry, the Career Warrior podcast by Let's, Eat, by Let's Eat Grandma. There are so many resources out there for us now. When I was first starting into the personal development field, I went to Barnes & Noble, I went to the bookstores, and I just sat there and I read for hours. How much do you really want to change where you're at? You can hire a coach. That's one way. But you also can take accountability for where you're at and decide to change it. I love that message. It's simple. It, you have to take ownership. You have to take action. And, you know, it, it, otherwise it's just talk, right? And that doesn't create any change. So um, thank you for, for your time and, and insight. I, I will make sure that we have all of your contact information in our show notes. Um yeah, I, I would love to pick your brain for hours and maybe I'll, I'll you know, talk you into coming back later on, Ben. But um, thanks so much for, for your uh, generosity of your time today. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, please reach out to me. I'd love to continue the conversation and also come back on if that's possible. Wonderful. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you at um, questions at zengig.com. Uh, straightforward as it gets. So thanks. Thanks again. Have a great night.